Hello friends, this is Alan Reinick, an attorney and a Seventh-day Adventist minister who serves as director of the Who's of the Church's Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Department, Liberty Magazine. He is also executive director of the Church State Council, and Reinick himself says the council is a Seventh-day Adventist organization. Now that Roe v. Wade is before the Supreme Court, we are predictably seeing Adventists in North America come out and try to influence how Adventists should think about this issue. Unfortunately, as will be thoroughly documented in this video, if you simply compare their statements to actual historical documented facts, there are serious problems. Just a few days ago, Reinick made a public statement here about the Supreme Court, and unfortunately, this contains many serious problems. So in this video, we will carefully review his claims. And as a reminder, what you see here, these are public statements. This is public, so the public is free to respond. Now, some people watching this video, some of you may prefer a short, brief summary. So of all the problems, here is the most egregious. Reinick says that because laws are being passed to protect children from violence, we need to be clear that what is at stake is more than the fate of abortion laws. But the shift toward what? Read it for yourself. Imposing coercive religious morals on the nation. The Seventh-day Adventist Church official position on abortion, which is published right here on their official World Church website, states in black and white right here in section 3, sentence 4. Let's read it together. The Sixth Commandment states, You shall not kill, Exodus 20.13, which calls for the preservation of human life. The principle to preserve life enshrined in the Sixth Commandment places abortion where? Within its scope and in section 2 defines the unborn as living human children with multiple biblical references. So the official church position defines abortion as an act that violates the Sixth Commandment. It is an act of murder. But Reinick right here publicly makes the completely opposite claim that killing these children is not a social civil issue, but one that is religious. Quote, imposing coercive religious morals. There are ten commandments, the first four are religious, and have to do with worship and our relationship to God, while the last six are social in nature and have to do with civil society. The government does not have the right to tell people how to worship, but the government does have the authority to govern civil society and enforce especially the Sixth Commandment. Now, maybe you might think that this is my own opinion, so please let me cite from a well-known professional. This is not going to be Andrew's opinion. No, let's cite from a highly esteemed expert who says, quote, this division between the first and second tables of the law roughly corresponds to the distinction between legislating religion and morality. Under the First Amendment, the state has not jurisdiction to address essentially religious questions, such as when, where, how, or whom to worship. The first table of the law is out of bounds to the state. However, the second table of the law has always been the subject of civil law, despite the familiar adage that you can't legislate morality. Actually, you can, and we do. And go ahead and guess. Just try to guess who said this. That's right, Alan J. Reinick. However, to make the claim that killing children is a religious issue is a gross violation and distortion of the most basic tenets of biblical theology. Religious freedom is based upon the right to life. If you have no right to life, you have no other right. By denying children, as he does, the right to live, he is literally contradicting and refuting his own claims to religious freedom. If you simply take his statements and put them next to each other, you can see that he is contradicting himself. Furthermore, the most famous person in Adventist history who preached these important truths was Alonzo T. Jones, who stated, quote, It is every man's right to worship according to his convictions, but if in the worship of his god or idol he tries to take the life of his fellow men, then the state can intervene because civil governments exist for the protection of life, and it must punish that man 
for his attempt upon the life of his fellow man. The state does not consider the question of religion. This is irrelevant because it punishes him for his incivility, for the attempted murder. Civil government must protect its citizens. This is strictly within Caesar's jurisdiction. It comes within the line of duties the what? The scriptures show pertain to our neighbor. The great irony is that, as you can see here, the church's official religious liberty association awarded the A.T. Jones medal to Reinick when Reinick himself argues the complete opposite of A.T. Jones. So see if you can figure that one out. And if that's not bad enough, check this out. Jones was the editor of the American Sentinel in an article written in 1891. Jones answers this question. Did Aristotle, Socrates, and many other Greek philosophers teach morality? And if not, did they teach immorality? Answer. They taught what they called morality, but they taught in practice what was really immorality. Plato taught both the expediency and lawfulness of exposing children to die in particular cases or infanticide, and Aristotle counseled abortion. In short, if the Greek philosophers could be set down in the United States today and should attempt to practice here what they both taught and practiced in Greece and counted it as morality, the whole gang of them would be in the what? In the penitentiary inside of a week. Jones said that deliberately killing children, whether born or unborn, is a reason to put people in the penitentiary. But today, the very people who justify killing children are awarded in the name of A.T. Jones. Again, see if you can figure that out. Reinick not only contradicts himself, he contradicts Jones. He contradicts the official teaching of the Adventist Church. And as we will now see, he also contradicts history and science. On December 1st, the Supreme Court will hear oral arguments in Dobbs v. Jackson, which involves a Mississippi law that bans nearly all abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy. The court is widely expected to reverse Roe v. Wade. Please take a moment to notice that Reinick himself admits that it is widely expected that Roe will be reversed. This is because even many pro-abortion legal scholars know that there are so many problems with Roe that it is not a matter of if, but a matter of when Roe is overturned. He continues, the court is widely expected to reverse Roe and return to the state legislators the power to determine that state's abortion laws, perhaps for the what? For the first time in history. This is false. This is not true. It is a historical documented fact that killing the unborn has been prosecuted as murder at least as far back as the 13th century. For example, in 1276, in the case of Rex versus Sharp, a husband was charged with a man's death for killing the unborn child of his wife. And just a few years later, in 1281, Rex versus Code, three men were convicted and imprisoned for the felony of killing an unborn child. This remained a crime in common law for the next 600 years. During the 19th century, due to the advances in scientific technology that led to the discovery that a new human life begins at conception, the American Medical Association, not Jerry Falwell, the physicians of the American Medical Association, began their nationwide campaign campaign for abortion to be codified in statutory law. By 1900, every state of the Union had laws on their books against abortion. These are documented historical facts. Reinick's claim that this is the first time in history is false because it was already a state's issue until Roe. Now, why would Reinick say this? Let's continue. For the first time in history, actually ruling that a right previously held to be constitutionally protected no longer enjoys such status. Reinick is trying to implant into the Adventist mind the claim that abortion is a constitutionally protected right. But what he does not tell you is that the reason why Roe is being challenged and expected to be overturned is precisely because of all of the evidence that it was in fact not a right. The very same people who passed the anti-abortion legislation of the 19th century are the exact same people who passed the 14th Amendment. The United States was terribly divided on slavery, but not on abortion. All of the free states and all of the slave states, all of them unanimously passed anti-abortion legislation to protect children from being killed, thus giving evidence 
that the very people who supported the 14th Amendment believed that the unborn are in fact living human children and that it's wrong to kill children. When Roe was passed, Justice Blackmun, to justify his decision, cited a what is now a thoroughly debunked revisionist history by Cyril Chestnut Means, attorney at that time for NARAL, but since that time the fake history from Means has been repeatedly refuted and condemned for its false claims. When Reinick admits that it's widely expected to be reversed, it's because legal scholars recognize the serious problems with this history, among other problems. Reinick, however, typical of Adventist leadership in North America, completely ignores this history and claims that it's a constitutional right, a claim that is indefensible. A very critical fact that Reinick also omits is that the Adventist Church was founded in 1863 in the middle of the AMA's nationwide campaign to outlaw abortion, a campaign led by the famous Dr. Horatio Storer. Remember that name. In June of 1867, the official journal of the church, the Review and Herald, published an article titled Fashionable Murder, stating, As a class, the medical profession have taken a noble stand. As guardians of human life, they are compelled to do so. Society owes a debt of gratitude to who? Dr. Horatio Storer. Notice that today, Adventist leaders in North America, they just love to preach about the pioneers on slavery and temperance. They just love to tell us that the pioneers stood up against unjust laws and that they urged the legislation to curb alcohol and these social evils. But what they never say is that these same pioneers publicly supported anti-abortion legislation. They condemned other denominations who supported abortion and they publicly condemned this as child murder and infanticide, as an enormous and appalling evil. Question for you, have you ever heard Reinick mention this history? If not, why not? This history is well documented. How come he does not mention this? If what the pioneers did on slavery and temperance was so important that we need to be constantly reminded of their example, how come they never tell us about their example on abortion? Why is that? Let's continue. There is a dimension to this issue that most, including legal scholars, overlook. So Reinick continues and makes the claim that he knows something important that all of these scholars have overlooked. All of these other educated, experienced professionals have overlooked something. Well, what could that be? The issue of abortion has always been predicated on the determination of when human life begins and when it is worthy of legal protection. Yes, that is true. Now watch very carefully. Watch what he does in the next sentence. For most legal purposes, the unborn do not enjoy the same status as those who are born. For example, the unborn lack inheritance rights if a father dies while the mother is pregnant. This is a word trick called a red herring. A red herring is a logical fallacy in which irrelevant information is presented alongside relevant information, distracting attention from that relevant information. The question of inheritance rights is completely irrelevant, as he himself just admitted it is predicated on whether the unborn are living human children. Whether or not the unborn can receive inheritance is irrelevant in determining if the unborn are human and if it's okay to kill them. To give him the benefit of the doubt, however, maybe Reinick did this by accident or unintentionally. Now, if it's all about whether the unborn are human, we would expect Reinick to be consistent and to give us some scientific or biblical evidence to answer this question. Does he do so? Let's see. Roman Catholic theology holds that the immortal soul enters the womb at the moment of conception. This doctrine has influenced evangelical opposition to abortion. This again is false. This is wrong because it misrepresents and bears false witness of what the Roman Catholic Church actually teaches. From their 1974 Declaration on Procured Abortion published by the Vatican, this declaration expressly leaves aside the question of the moment when the spiritual soul is infused. There is not, read it for yourself, there is not a unanimous tradition on this point, and authors are as yet in disagreement. Later in the 1995 Evangelium Vitae, the Pope wrote, 
even if the presence of a spiritual soul cannot be ascertained by empirical data from the standpoint of moral obligation, the mere probability that a human person is involved would suffice to justify an absolutely clear prohibition of any intervention aimed at killing a human embryo. Because, as the document continues, from the time that the ovum is fertilized, a life is begun which is neither that of the father nor the mother. It is rather the life of a what? a new human being. In other words, the Catholic Church teaches that at conception, a new human being is formed. It's a boy or girl, and that at some moment, at or near conception, that boy or girl receives an immortal soul. This is the process known as ensoulment. The Catholic Church admits there is disagreement. There is not a unanimous tradition, but nevertheless, whether that boy or girl has received a soul or not, it is still a living human child and as such should not be killed. Ask yourself the question, why is it that when Adventists talk about the Sabbath and Catholicism, they are very careful to cite chapter and verse and provide multiple references for what Catholics teach. But when it comes to the Sixth Commandment, they make these wide, sweeping, gross generalizations that are not even true. Why is that? We Adventists, we get all upset when someone misrepresents us, but when we do this to others, that's now okay? He says, This doctrine has influenced evangelical opposition to abortion, although I am unsure the extent to which evangelicals have embraced the theology itself. Please take a moment to appreciate that in the very sentence where he accuses evangelicals, he himself admits He's not even sure if they really believe this. By the way, this is not Photoshop. He made these accusations, but then admits he doesn't even know if it's true. As an attorney, and especially as a minister, he should better understand, more than anyone else, the importance of providing actual evidence for your accusations. Notice carefully that Reinach also omits the historical fact that Catholics played almost no role in abortion being made illegal. Law professor and historian Joseph Della Pena notes that the Catholic Church largely remained silent on abortion in the 19th century, and Catholics generally were not involved in legislative efforts to craft legal prohibitions on abortion. How exactly is the modern-day evangelical opposition to abortion connected to Catholic dogma? Reinick, like other North American Adventist leadership, never attempts to explain, and this proves a very important point. When Adventists talk about abortion, people are declared guilty by accusation. In a courtroom, when there is a case before a real judge and the attorney is asking for a guilty verdict, he has to actually provide evidence. Unfortunately, as we have seen repeatedly, Adventist leaders in North America will find you guilty simply by accusation. You are guilty because they say you are. Ipsy Dixit or Ex Cathedra, it's true because they said it's true. This, however, is a big problem because it contradicts the Bible that you have to provide witnesses and evidence. Furthermore, even if evangelical and Catholic teachings on abortion share similarities, so what? So what? That is not an argument. Adventists and Catholics, we both agree on the virgin birth of Jesus and his bodily resurrection. Should we abandon these beliefs simply because we share this in common with Catholics? Should we abandon the Sabbath because those Seventh-day Baptists also honor the Fourth Commandment? And the, the Jehovah Witnesses, they share with us the same belief about the state of the dead. Should we abandon that too? Reinick's attempted guilt by association doesn't work. And furthermore, what does Reinick propose that we do with Adventist pioneers, including Ellen White, who all unanimously and consistently <laughs> defined the unborn as living human children? Were they somehow secretly influenced by Rome or the ghost of Jerry Falwell? Adventist pioneers denounced abortion as an enormous evil, as the most unnatural, most inhuman, most revolting of all crimes against human life. They praised the work of the American 
Medical Association to outlaw abortion. Is this because the pioneers were secretly reading books by Dr. Everett Koop? Did Dr. Francis Schaefer somehow travel back in time and show his videos to Adventist pioneers? To be sure, opposition to abortion has been grounded in Catholic doctrine. Again, that is false. That is not true. Notice that we are only in the third paragraph and he has already made multiple false statements. Catholics were not involved in making abortion illegal. It was overwhelmingly Protestant physicians. Dr. Bernard Nathanson, the famous abortionist and early founder of NARAL who worked to make abortion legal, he as a Jew would later convert to be a Catholic and would later publish books explaining how they lied to the public to advance the abortion agenda. One of the most influential people who he worked with was Lawrence or Larry Later, a champion of abortion rights. To give you an idea of Later's influence, the Supreme Court cited him nine times in their Roe decision. In his book, Aborting America, Nathanson writes that both he and Later decided to specifically attack Catholics. This was not by accident. They did this on purpose. As Later said, every revolution has to have its villain, and they chose the Catholic hierarchy on purpose so that they could frame opposition to abortion as being being a purely Catholic and not interreligious. This was their goal and that's exactly what they did. They were very careful to vilify especially the leaders and not lay members because they wanted liberal Catholics to join them and they succeeded. So when Reinick accuses people who oppose killing children as being dupes of Catholic dogma, he's doing the exact same thing that they did back then. This abortionist Nathanson later demonstrated the honesty and moral courage to express sorrow and regret for his previous false claims. Will the Adventist minister, Alan Reinick, also admit and apologize for these false claims? Let's hope so. He continues. Restricting the killing of children by abortion is certainly the imposition of a sectarian doctrinal teaching on society at large and thereby implicates the Establishment Clause. It is a form of, read it for yourself, religious establishment. But is it any different than, say, laws against murder? Are those also religious establishments? Clearly, no. Laws against murder do not implicate sectarian religious views. Right here, Reinick reveals a tremendous weakness and absurdity. He wants to affirm that murder should be illegal for born children, while at the same time claiming that murder does not apply to unborn children. You notice that? He argues that it should be legal to kill your child 30 seconds before it is born. But if you kill your child 30 seconds after it is born, then you should be charged with murder. Now, here's the question. How in the world does he make this distinction? How does traveling a few inches down the birth canal change whether it should be legal to kill you? Again, he doesn't tell us, but the only logical explanation would be the belief that the unborn are not living human beings. Reinick, like many other North American Adventist church leaders, does not want to come out and openly, publicly try to defend the claim that the unborn are not living human children because to do so, would make Reinick appear absurd for not only rejecting established biological medical scientific facts, but also rejecting the Bible, which repeatedly in both the Old and New Testaments defined the unborn with the exact same Greek and Hebrew words used for born children. And as was already noted, the Adventist church already publicly, officially, I'll say that again, publicly, officially teaches that abortion is murder. So Reinick's claim here puts him in direct opposition to the church that he professes to represent. In order to highlight the hypocrisy and absurdity, notice that the Adventist Church's top leadership at the General Conference have for many years very publicly called for legislation banning smoking for the purpose of protecting unborn children from cigarette smoke. The GC says, support smoking bans, exclamation mark. This of course begs the question, why is it a crime to hurt the child with tobacco smoke, but a matter of personal freedom to violently dismember that same child via abortion? Why is it okay to impose 
our morals on society via legislation and compel people to protect the unborn from cigarettes but not from murder. For reasons I'll let you decide, nobody in Adventist leadership has been eager or willing to explain these contradictions. Moving on, did you know that in 1973, following the Roe decision, Adventist religious liberty leadership actually defended the right of Christians to protest the legalization of murder? They even wrote in a follow-up that if the Supreme Court is to be condemned, let it be condemned for its what? Its alleged failure to protect society from the civil crime of killing its citizens rather than for failing to stamp out ecclesiastical sin. Now, you might be asking yourself the question, why is it that Reinick doesn't mention any of this history? That's a great question, and thankfully, we have research papers from Loma Linda University and official publications of the church that document this history. It is a fact that the Adventist Church in North America accepted abortion in 1970-71 for the purpose of making money from killing children. However, knowing that church members would not accept this, they purposely kept it a secret. In the mid-1980s, however, the secret began to spill out because evangelicals and Catholics were protesting the abhorrent practice of abortion on demand in Adventist hospitals. When this was published in the international news like the Washington Post, Adventist leadership became creative and began to claim that killing children was a religious freedom. Church leadership are so serious, they were so serious about this ideology that in 1988, they filed a brief with the Supreme Court in Webster claiming that abortion was a religious freedom issue, but thankfully such absurd claims were dismissed. Not to be deterred, folks like John V. Stevens Sr., Religious Liberty Director for the Pacific Union, began to claim that the Catholic evangelical opposition to torturing and killing children was a threat to religious liberty. For many decades, Adventists who have requested biblical evidence for our position were treated with scorn and contempt, mocked and ridiculed as obvious dupes of Jerry Falwell's magical spell. No leader or theologian or administrator, however, has ever, underscore this point, has ever produced even a single shred of evidence to support the Adventist claims about abortion. And they cannot and they will not because no such evidence exists. It was the Americans who brought abortion into the church to make money. It was the Americans who covered this up. As has been documented, they stacked the committees with Americans because they knew that the world church opinion was much more stronger against abortion than in the USA. And it was the Americans who gave the Adventist Church the ideology that killing children is a religious freedom, and of course it has been the Americans and the GC who have never allowed the World Church to vote on this issue because they know what the outcome would be. It's always equality and fairness all the time, unless the church has to deal with abortion. Then the Americans get to determine everything. With the advent of the internet, however, church leaders have lost control of the narrative and laity are now aware of the scam. The criticism was so bad that in 2019, the Adventist Church tried to give the appearance of revising its position but ended up maintaining the same misleading euphemisms and loopholes. Church leaders tried to stamp down the suspicion and allegations of wrongdoing but ended up with egg on their face because in, I think it was July or August of 2020, the GC Health Ministries Department claimed that abortion for mental health was acceptable. The exact same position of both Roe versus Wade and earlier Adventist statements. The outrage was so bad that the GC had to delete their new protocol. Sorry, that page cannot be found. Unfortunately for them, I downloaded a copy and have since shared it widely. Now that you have a brief snapshot of the history, you can appreciate, we can appreciate and understand why Reinick makes the statements that he does. The Adventist Church, via the North Americans, has gone all in on abortion as a religious freedom, so Reinick now has to try to defend something that is indefensible. By the way, as was already mentioned, one of the most prominent voices to claim abortion as a religious freedom was John V. Stevens Sr., at that time a director for the Pacific Union. Now, Stevens, he made all sorts 
sorts of wild claims. He said that a person is a human being, but that you are not alive until after you are born. Here's just one of many wild quotes. Life theologically, and read it for yourself, physiologically takes place at birth. Now, I don't know of any denomination or any religion or even any cult for that matter who denies the scientific, biological, physiological fact that there is a new life in the womb. Stevens, however, did so. His arguments, if you can call them that, are full of all sorts of absurd statements and accusations. And this is the man who played a major role in trying to help the American church leadership figure out a way to to justify abortion. That is a fact, but when someone pointed this out, of all people, Reinick got upset and notice what he said. It is unkind to speak ill of those who are dead and cannot defend themselves. Well, that's like the unborn child. John Stevens was a mentor to me. He was a devout Adventist leader who had a deep grasp of biblical truth and of the spirit of prophecy. Well, if he had such a deep grasp of biblical truth, then why doesn't anyone today want to defend his claims? You notice that? And if he was so familiar with the spirit of prophecy, then how come he never explains why Ellen White defined the unborn as living human children? According to Stevens, that is Roman Catholic dogma. Ellen White repeatedly affirmed that when a woman is pregnant, there are two lives, but Stephen says, no, there is only one. Not only is he contradicting science and the scriptures, but also Ellen White. But how can this be if Stevens has such a deep grasp of truth? Stevens himself admits, page 173, if the scripture calls it a child while it is being formed, then certainly it must be a child and hence a person, and then spends the rest of the book going through every conceivable contortion to ignore or outright deny that the Bible repeatedly defines the unborn as living human children with the exact same Greek and Hebrew words used for born children. Nowhere, nowhere throughout the entire Bible is there any evidence whatsoever for some superstitious pagan concept of achieving some magical status of personhood. A living human being remains a living human being regardless of its size, level of development, or dependency. Your geographical location, in or outside your house, in or outside the car, in or outside of a mother's womb, does not make you any less of a human being. Reinick says, some are eager to criticize the Adventist religious liberty leadership. I can tell you as one of those criticized that we are steeped, oh, we are steeped in the teachings of Ellen White and the Bible. So don't you for a moment think that your church religious liberty leaders are theologically immature or unbalanced or politically biased or naive. Well, if that is true, then why can't any of them provide evidence for their claims? And why is there such a long history of misleading and false statements? If they are such experts as they claim to be, who know what they are talking about, and why have they never been willing to debate anyone who questions their claims? Reinick himself says, I am not interested in a debate. And of course, the biggest tell if these Supreme Court cases are in fact threatening religious freedom, then why isn't Reinick and the NAD or GC filing any briefs? You notice that? Notice that Reinick, like others, they say repeatedly, this is a threat to religious freedom, but they won't do anything to respond to this supposed threat. You notice that? Anyways, moving on, Reinick says Protestant denominations generally supported the relaxing of abortion laws. Yes, because it was presented as a health issue. Dr. Bernard Nathanson admitted that the abortion lobby used deceptive statistics that all types of women were dying and deceptive euphemisms and language to hide from the American public the true nature of abortion. The exact same thing happened in the Adventist church as well. Nobody had any idea that the word health would be the loophole to justify abortion on demand. That's why several years later in the mid to late 1970s, 70s, when the nation became aware of the deception, the pushback began, and the biggest catalyst, arguably, for the pushback was the efforts of people like Dr. Francis Schaeffer and Dr. Everett Koop to educate their audiences to the reality. This is all very well documented. See historian Dr. Williams' book, Defenders of the Unborn, the Pro-Life Movement Before Roe vs. Wade.
The push to completely ban abortion, that is not true, is the result of decades of effective advocacy by those with a sectarian religious view. Wow, this is amazing. Please explain how the best and brightest minds in the Adventist Church never saw this. The Adventist Church literally began during a nationwide campaign to make abortion illegal, a campaign that continued for several decades. And yet, amazingly, Ellen White, with the gift of prophecy and all of the very many talented and gifted leadership of our church for over 100 years, never perceived the danger that Reinick now perceives. Please explain how the American Medical Association and all of their physicians until the 1960s were religiously sectarian. Explain why all of the lawmakers and legislatures and the government of all the states of the 19th century and early 20th century were all sectarian. This claim is misleading because there is no neutrality between life and death. That little baby girl or that little baby boy will live or it will die. And to argue that deliberately killing that child should be legal is to deny that the child is a living human being. Anyways, so much more can be said, but let's finish on what is arguably the most dishonest statement. My point here is not to take a position on the morality of abortion while he's literally trying to influence people's perceptions on the morality of legalized abortion. I just think we need to be clear that what is at stake is more than the fate of abortion laws, but the shift towards imposing what? Coercive religious morals on the nation. In order to appreciate this error, just replace the word abortion with slavery or rape. My point here is not to take a position on the morality of rape or slavery or pedophilia. We need to be clear that what is at stake is the shift towards imposing coercive religious morals. Now, normally such a statement would be considered absurd or grotesque, but it gets worse because remember, this is the same man who says the second table of the law has always been the subject of civil law, despite the familiar adage that you can't legislate morality. Actually, according to Reinick, you can, and we do. All you have to do, again, is juxt juxtapose his own statements, and you can see here he's saying the exact opposite. Again, these are his words, which he posted publicly. So, in summary, he claims to be steeped in the Bible and theologically mature, yet everything he says is in direct opposition to history, science, facts, and the scriptures, and to his own church. And he provides no evidence for his accusation. So now that we are finished with this, let's have some fun and read some of the comments. And remember, these are public. These are public for the whole world to see. Right now, the most upvoted comment is right here. We are quick to condemn Middle Eastern countries that rule under Sharia law. Oh my. Yet many evangelicals here want the same system in America, only with their interpretation of, notice the adjective, Christian law. This right here highlights the hypocrisy. Lots to say, but here's a big hypocrisy. They love to publicly condemn Muslims who kill people in the name of religion, but literally, these American Adventists, in the exact same breath, they literally defend killing children as a religious liberty. This is absurd. Why? Why is it wrong for the Muslim to kill in the name of religion, but okay for the American Adventist? What makes you so special? If taking someone's life is truly a matter of religious freedom, then you don't get to tell other people how to practice their religion. If you get to kill, then they get to kill also. And again, killing children is not a religious Christian law. It is a civil law of the last six commandments. What about bank robbery and rape? Are those also Christian law? I don't see them protesting that. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate clear-headed analyses of church-state separation issues. Too many Adventists don't read our own Liberty Magazine. That's good. That's a good thing. They listen to evangelical rhetoric. Yes, that is a good thing because evangelicals are correct and we are wrong. They base their position on the Bible and science. That's why neither Alan nor anyone else at Liberty will try to refute their arguments. By the way, here's a piece of trivia. This here is Scott Klusendorf, and he is one of the most widely cited and respected evangelical pro-life apologists. And guess what? He's also a 
former Adventist, but you will never see Reinick or any Adventist church leader try to debate him because it would be humiliating. That's why they rely so much on smears and accusation. And here you go. This is David Ashrick speaking about this exact same issue of abortion before the Supreme Court affirmed that this is certainly the domain of earthly governments. If Reinick wants to talk so tough about evangelicals and smear them, then why doesn't he come out and publicly challenge Pastor David Ashrick if this is as dangerous and threatening as he claims? And if Pastor David is promoting this, then where is all of his tough talk now? You notice that? They will talk tough about people who are outside our church. They love to talk tough about people who are dead, but when it's people inside our church like Pastor David, they say nothing. So the next time that you hear some leader in the NAD or GC spout off some nonsense about killing unborn children as a religious freedom, ask them to debate or call out Pastor David Ashrick and then watch what happens. Someone else asked the great question, is it a double murder when a pregnant woman is murdered? That's a great question. It would be wonderful to see Reinick or any other church leader answer this question on video, but we will not because to admit that it is murder would expose the falsehood. Another great question is, what is the biblical principle that distinguishes a baby born two months premature from a seven month fetus, making it a crime to kill the first, but merely an exercise of personal freedom to destroy destroy the second. And that, my friends, right there is the jugular question. All of their false claims rests entirely upon their ability to answer this question, but they can't do so and will never do so because it's all a big magic show. It's just one big fraud. They claim it's religious in nature, but can't provide even a single shred of evidence in support. Anyways, that's it for today. If you'd like more information or documentation to learn more, please see the links down below. Thank you for watching.